Robert Marston again with another um, video preview of one of our new projects. This is our newest project which will be available at the end of November and it is a three CD set and we have chosen to call it The Dawn of Recording. Now most of you who know about my work in the field uh, already know that I deal with very early records and uh, We've uh, released re many recordings from 1902, 1903, 1904, 1905, and the, you know, all the early times, the days of the 20th century. But these recordings predate um, any commercial recordings by at least 10 years. And uh, it's a fascinating uh, topic, uh, and uh, I'd like to just give you some idea as to what will be contained in uh, this three CD set and how it all came about. First of all, I must talk about the man who made them. His name is Julius Block. He was born in 1858. He was born into a family of business uh, people. His father was a very successful businessman, international businessman, and um, Block took over his father's company in the 1880s. And he had dealings in Russia, and Germany, and Austria, and England, and America. And sometime in the late uh, 1880s, probably in 1889, Block uh, began to read in newspapers about this new invention called the phonograph, uh, which was basically was captivating um, you know, audiences because Edison had begun to demonstrate the phonograph publicly and it was being written up in newspapers all over the world. Block uh, made a trip to the United States for some business purposes and he decided to visit Edison in the uh, laboratory, in Edison's laboratory in West Orange, New Jersey. And when he went to see Edison, Edison had no particular interest in meeting Block, but finally he agreed to meet with him. And over the next few hours, Edison demonstrated the phonograph to Block, and Block became obsessed about owning a phonograph. By the end of the day, Edison had agreed to provide Block with a phonograph and some blank cylinders, and immediately Block sailed for Russia. Where he, that was where he was really living, that's where his headquarters uh, was at the time. He had an apartment in Moscow and a, uh, and a house in St. Petersburg. And uh, his primary business was in Russia. Uh, as, a, as, a, I'm just gonna, as an incidental uh, remark, uh, Bloch uh, introduced such important uh, novelties as the bicycle and the escalator to Russia at this time. And he also wanted to introduce the phonograph. Edison had the, had the idea of marketing the phonograph as a dictating device for office use. And Edison really didn't have any particular idea of making recordings of, of music. Uh, Bloch, however, had a much, a much deeper vision about the phonograph and its, its use. And Bloch, uh, he was an amateur pianist himself. And he knew a lot of musicians in Russia. He was friendly with Tchaikovsky, he was friendly with Anton Rubinstein, he was friendly with Arensky, Taneyev, uh, a number of important singers and violinists. And he decided, when he brought the phonograph to Russia, that he would invite people to his house and make cylinder recordings of famous musicians, either playing the piano, singing, or playing the violin. He saved these recordings and um, guarded them very carefully and uh, um, preserved them and really uh, uh, was very cognizant of their historic value. Julius Block died in 1934 and uh, subsequently his family donated this collection of rare cylinder recordings to an archive in Berlin. Now everyone believed that these cylinders had been destroyed during the war with the bombing of Berlin uh, but it turned out that uh, the Soviets uh, removed the cylinders for safekeeping and took them to St. Petersburg, where they were housed at the, in a, um, a building called the Pushkin House in St. Petersburg. Uh, but uh, in the West, no one knew where they were until very recently. And, uh, the, and uh, everyone who knew about the collection, including Bloch's family, believed that they had been destroyed. Um, Block, Block's son had uh, published in the 1960s uh, a memoir uh, written by his father 
and um, in the introduction to that memoir, Bloch's son indicates that the cylinder collection had definitely been destroyed. So we are pleased to, to announce to the world uh, that it uh, is safe in St. Petersburg, and uh, we traveled to St. Petersburg to supervise the transferring of these cylinders to a uh, digital domain. Now, what is on these cylinders? Well. There, we, we're issuing about 90 of them. Some of them are piano, some are violin, and some are voice. And the sound of the cylinders is remarkable for the period. So what is on these cylinders? Well, they contain piano recordings, violin recordings, and some recordings of singers. And many of the uh, musicians recorded by Bloch during the 1890s uh, never made records. Uh, for example, there's a, a famous pianist who was a, a well-known pupil of Liszt, whose name was Paul Pabst. And uh, Pabst died uh, before commercial recording was a reality, so there was no way that Pabst could, make, could have made records. And um, some of the Pabst cylinders made by Bloch are among the finest sounding recordings in the entire collection. And uh, I have uh, decided to, to play a little clip of a uh, Paps playing a bit of his paraphrase, uh, his piano paraphrase of the of the waltz from Tchaikovsky's Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> three block cylinders was Joseph Hoffman. These are Hoffman's earliest recordings and made uh, when he was uh, under, well, just about 20 years old. And they're fantastic records as well. And there are a number of, of great musicians represented in this collection and I urge you to go to our website where you can see a complete listing of the contents of this uh, album, this three CD set, and you can read biographies of the musicians and you can read also a history of the Bloch collection and the biography of Julius Bloch himself. This collection is the earliest collection of classical music recordings ever made. The only, uh, there are only a couple isolated examples of classical music recordings that predate this. For example, the Brahms Cylinder from 1889. But this body of recordings actually sounds much better than the Brahms Cylinder and you can really hear a great deal more music. Uh, on these cylinders. Um, Bloch was the first enthusiast to make private cylinder recordings and he was followed later in the 90s by Johnny Bettini who made recordings of famous singers and of course Lionel Mapleson who recorded some live performances, live performance excerpts at the Metropolitan Opera House between 1901 and 1904. But uh, I I hope that you'll enjoy this 3D, uh, this 3 CD set, and I, I think, as I said before, this is the most important project that we have uh, issued to date, and I urge you to uh, read our website and to uh, purchase a copy of The Dawn of Recording.